OK, um, so good morning, everybody. Thank you um, very much. All right, to be six. Let this person in. That's the last person we're waiting for. Fabulous. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this training session. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Debbie McCutcheon from Skills Development Scotland. I work in the digital economy and FS um, skills sector team, and we have been working on the tech industry in the classroom programme for a long time now with Craig and Daniel. Um, the real purpose of the, the programme is very much bringing industry together with um, schools to sort of co-design and um, co-deliver content so that not only the, the learners are benefiting from this sort of real world um, lessons but actually the teachers get a lot out of it as well um, and the purpose of these training sessions are to help anyone that's wanting to engage with schools using these resources or even creating resources so you can get some inspiration from what we have done and um, some top tips on how to deliver it um, and also what, what to, we're going to do today is run through one of our sort of popular exercises so that you can play along and get a feel for how to do it. Or you can just watch um, what Craig and Daniel are doing so you can get a good feel for how to deliver it if you're going to do it with groups of young people. So I'm going to hand over to Craig and Daniel who are going to run the session and I hope everybody finds it really worthwhile. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. Daniel, how's that looking? Can you see what's going on? Oh, you're on mute now. To me yes, a minute ago. <laughs> so thank you for joining us this morning as part of Cyber Scotland Week as well. So we're, we're really pleased to be running this today. I do recognise a few faces who have joined us today, but I know that not everyone will know us and everybody watching the video would know us as well. So just to say hello, uh, my name is Craig Steele. I'm a computer scientist, I'm a gadget geek, and I'm interested in all things tech. And co-leading this workshop with me today, it's Daniel. Hello, Daniel. Hello. I uh, <laughs> hope you're all, all OK. Yeah, my background's in engineering originally, but the last few years I've been in cyber security in the public and the energy sectors looking at critical national infrastructure. But me and Craig work at Digital Skills Education, where we bring sort of digital skills and opportunities to young people. And we've run and developed countless workshops and events over the last well, I don't know how many years it's been. We've been de developing workshops been through probably seven or eight years, seven or eight since, years. Mm -hmm. since starting sort of programming clubs. Yeah, so we've got experience working with young learners, but also training volunteers from industry as well. So um, I was part of a project called Coder Dojo, which is a network of coding clubs for young people as well. And that was all about how people from industry could meet with young people in these sort of social environments and share their skills and their knowledge as well. It would be good to know in the chat as well, like if you could tell us what are you hoping to get out of today's session? So maybe type in the chat your name and um, I think I've got a few examples here. What are you hoping to get out of today's session? Is it maybe about learning how to use these tools? Is it finding more about them? Is it because you're going to be using them in a classroom? And um, we'll just give you a second to answer that. Maybe yeah. you're here to solve a murder, Daniel, I hadn't thought that. Yeah, it'd be good to know if you're here kind of as a potential volunteer or you're looking for new resources to use in a classroom or maybe you're just kind of generally interested and want to get hands on. Uh, Craig, what was the coding thing you mentioned? Yeah, it was co a company called Coder Dojo. Coder, Coder Dojo, thanks. Yeah, I'll put the name of it in the chat. Craig from Digital Extras looking to see some unique and different examples of how to engage young people with tech. And hello, Ula, as well. And do you only do digital forensics or is it just one exercise out of many? Oh, we've got like, we'll give you a sort of preview of all the different ones that oh, we're excellent. doing. Today we're only going to be solving a murder, mm -hmm. but if you're interested in other areas of uh, digital stuff, then what, what background are you from or? Um, so I'm uh, I'm working in version one. It's an IT consultancy. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I'm asking about other projects is because I don't think we do much in cybersecurity. So I'll yeah. take this back to the company. But this particular exercise may not be for us. That's why I'm I, I'm yeah. asking about the other ones. So if you're an IT consultancy, do you maybe more interested in things like software development or yeah yeah yeah. 
yeah, so we've got workshops on things like debugging and writing programming and I can't think off the top of my head, Daniel, but uh, sort of uh, behave like testing, like how to test code. We've also got things on sort of data science, how you can kind of use code to kind of look through data sets and things as well. But yeah, we'll show you um, some of these resources later on as well. We'll keep that in mind. Brilliant. Um, Thank you. Catherine is looking to see what resources are available for schools to develop interest in the tech industry. Perfect. Uh, Maha uh, at Digital Extra Fund looking for examples to engage young people in tech. And Belinda saying some new resources. Uh, so Belinda's a developing young workforce coordinator for two schools and they're looking for ideas and great new ways of delivering. Super, it sounds like we've got probably the perfect audience here, Craig. Of That's it. A, a nice mix then. And uh, Maha has attended every single one of these for this, so I, I don't know if there was a certificate or something, Debbie, that you can <laughs> give Maha for full attendance. Oh, I know, we should look into that. Brilliant. So the aims of that Industry in the Classroom project that we've been working on with Skills Development Scotland is it's all about inspiring learners into further skills development. So not just cyber security, but other digital technologies areas as well. And we want to be able to encourage them to consider a career in Scotland's tech industry. And an important part of that is how can we help industry volunteers support teachers and learners in the classroom by delivering high quality, industry relevant learning into the classroom. So yeah, I can see that from based on what you have said here, a lot of you might have engaged with schools directly or you're maybe thinking about it or maybe you're someone who's helping make those connections between it as well. And I think all the, the materials that we'll be covering today, Daniel, like will be useful for everyone in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of as well, like this kind of virtual engagement model sort of working remotely with classrooms. This isn't something that we just started doing in the last couple of years. We've been doing this for probably at least four years, engaging with young people over, over the internet. And that's because we've had this project with SDS called uh, Cyber Discover, and we've been running Cyber Skills Live. That's a series of sort of live and online cyber security, but also broader uh, computer science into 11 to 14 year olds. And Craig, we've had over 200,000 learners engaging with these with these lessons. So that's kind of an area that we focus on and we specialise in is, you know, how can we create engaging online learning experiences? We were even doing one last night. If we look a bit tired, we, we did a late shift for <laughs> um, young people who were maybe taking part from scout groups and people doing sort of learning at home with their parents. And there was a youth group from um, somewhere in Ireland, Daniel, as well, who were definitely taking part. There was, yeah. So we were stealing pizzas with them, which is another one of the activities. But let's not think about the, the virtual side of it for the moment. So thinking back to the basics, what is it that makes a great industry in the classroom session? So is it something like cool projects, interesting lessons? Is it getting to play with the technology? And what about from the school side? It, what, what would be a good session? Is it something that gets more of your pupils choosing it as a subject? From an employer point of view, what is it that you would want out of it? Is it the chance for your staff to do something a bit different? Is it the chance to be able to give something back? Or is it about, you know, potentially helping people know about your company so that if they were going to apply for a job in the future, they might be considering you? So when we thought back to our um, coding clubs or coder dojo clubs, we asked learners what they enjoyed the most, which of these sort of things. And these were the three things that they always came back with. It's always an element of learning something new. So I know from my own experiences in the classroom that learners are always eager to learn more about technology. They, they enjoy trying out new tech or playing around with something that they maybe don't normally get to do in their, their regular class. So the educational content is important. And that's why it's not just about an industry volunteer coming in and doing a sort of fireside chat or an interview or just promoting their business. There needs to be some sort of educational content to make it worthwhile for the learner and the teacher too. It shouldn't feel like a school lesson. They like the sort of change of pace. They like the fact that this is a different type of activity from what they would normally do in the classroom. So when we structured our lessons, they wouldn't feel like you would normally expect a classroom session to look like. It has to have its own energy, its own um, way of doing it. 
And if you can find a way to make learners feel excited or have fun or curious about something, that will also really help the learners and it helps the volunteers feel good about being involved. But by far the most important thing, the thing that the learners said they appreciated the most about these things is the people. It's what they told us over and over again. It's the fact that they are getting the chance to speak to someone who is doing that as a job, who is working in that industry. They are maybe by the end of the session, they're at a point where they're comfortable enough to ask them questions and find out more about it. And that's, you know, like a really um, key part of it. So we needed to make sure that any activities we designed brought in these elements to it. But there are barriers that made virtual engagement difficult because we've got talented volunteers with experiences and skills to share, but we also recognise that they're not teachers. They're not used to delivering lessons. They might not be used to sort of what level are learners at, you know, and, and that's a difficult thing to do, even if you're in the classroom, far less doing it remotely. So the challenge there is how do you make something that is exciting, that is at the right level of difficulty, that can be used in learning spaces and classrooms. So you might have something that would work great in an office where it's all set up the way you want it, but what could you actually do if you were in a school environment? And from a technical perspective, how can you make sure that that virtual engagement is interactive, it's easy to use and ultimately safe? So we needed to overcome those technical issues too. So um, we went about addressing some of these barriers and how, how did we do it, Daniel? What are these barriers? And then you can talk a bit about what we've made to support. You're on mute. Yeah, so we wanted to try and make it as easy as possible for the teachers, the learners and the volunteers to all have this kind of high quality engagement. We want to make it easy for the learners to be able to kind of speak to the the industry professional and have that access that they just don't normally get to have in school we wanted to make it easy for the teachers to kind of facilitate and host the session but it's also really important that the volunteers don't feel like they've got a really difficult task in front of them they've got to learn lots of things they've got to adapt to two different setups so you know we wanted something that could be pick up and play and then they can kind of get started so what we've done is we've created some high quality materials and we've tried and tested them with some classes and if you use these hopefully you'll be able to kind of make an impact in a classroom session so let me show you some of the the things that we've produced which are all online and you're free to to use and adapt and kind of um uh, and, and host your own engagements with classes so it'd be good to know in the chat you know have any of you any experience with some of the resources have you used the cyber skills live website have you come along to a live lesson maybe in the school you've been in, you've used some of these lesson packs that would be, be good to know in the chat. Or if you're new to it, let us know as well and we can kind of explain it a wee bit more and, and show you some in a bit more detail. I can see a few of your typing. I'll not put the pressure on. <laughs> I was just saying Catherine's new to it. And um, these will be new resources for her. As I said, yep, completely new. Some initiatives with high school students, but not with SDS or Cyber Society. OK, super. So what we'll do is I'll start with our virtual engagement best practice guide. And that's basically a step by step manual that we've created with SDS that will help you have a high quality engagement. So that starts off by telling you know, how you can prepare for an engagement and it presents regular best practice to help you get the most out of your time with the class. Because, you know, we don't expect you to be creating the activities that you're delivering and having to kind of come up with that. So in this document, you have all you need to know about planning and running a successful engagement from start to finish. So we've got checklists, we've got guides, we recommend different tools that you can use. We talk about how you can find activities and how you can kind of adapt existing things you've got to kind of fit within a classroom period. You know, how should you structure it? How long should you spend on different things? And it coaches you on how you can make the most out of your time with a class. So this is basically the culmination of Craig and I's experience spending hundreds of hours with learners. We've tried to kind of impart that into this guide. 
So for each step of an engagement, there's sort of practicable guidance that's written in a way that someone who's never done something like this can feel comfortable, confident and capable of running a session with a class. So this page here, this covers how to give a good introduction. So the general format of the document is it gives sort of step by step instructions of what to do and also some examples of of what not to do. You know, we've given examples of good and bad practices to help you out and you can always adapt that with a class. And every section ends with some best practice kind of bullet points which tell you the, the key message and there's lots of nice illustrations as well that kind of show you how these engagements might look or feel. So, you know, you've got kind of, you might be at home or in an office and then you're kind of being beamed onto the into the classroom as well. So that's the, the best practice guide. That's basically like the key document, but there are some other things that we've got too that you can use as well. So the next one of our sort of resources is a catalog of resources because, you know, there's loads of different educational resources out there that you can use to bring technology to life, but it can be quite difficult to find ones which are going to work well for learners at a particular age. It can be quite difficult to find ones that you can deliver in a classroom and it can be quite difficult to find ones which are suited to being done remotely where you just can't troubleshoot in the same way that you would if you're in the room with them. So we've created a catalog that brings together some examples of what we think are high quality resources suitable for high school age students. So again, these are tried and tested and they're great for volunteers to use in the classroom. So, you know, if you use one of these resources, you're going to be getting some of this sort of interesting, educational and relevant. And there's a summary for each one and then just some other sort of facts to help you choose. And then Craig, we've got some lesson packs as well. So these basically are a detailed lesson plan for lots of different activities that we've got on our Cyber Skills Live website, plus a couple of extra ones. And with these, you get a lesson plan, you get timings, you get slides, Craig, I think there's even videos for, for some yeah. of them as well. Videos and playthroughs so that you can actually see what the activity looks like. You might get a, an idea of how someone like me or Daniel would talk about it or deliver it as well. Um, you also get the slides. Did I say that? So it's like you could just fill in the slides with your own information and customise it. Um, so the idea is that we wanted to make these as pick up and play as possible. And that's what teachers and volunteers who have used it have told us. They like the fact that they don't have to spend a lot of time planning it, preparing it. They can pick up one of these guides. It's about six or seven pages just to read through and it gives you an overview. They might watch the video 15 minutes or so. They might play through the activity itself. And actually by doing these things, this is enough to get them you know, up and, and confident about doing it in the classroom. They haven't had to prepare the material. They haven't had to think about the order of it. It's it's been done for them. Yeah, so we've got, I think, six or seven of these uh, lesson guides available at the moment, and there's, there's more on the way as well that'll be up in the next month or two. And these lesson plans, you know, they all have a narrative to them as well. So, you know, even if not everyone inside the class is really interested in digital forensics, Hopefully everyone will kind of be able to get behind the story and kind of understand why they're doing it and what's going on. If you do take a look at these, you'll probably notice that all of the individual things that we ask the people to do are quite simple. And that's because it has to be when you're doing it remotely, because troubleshooting is just quite difficult to do. We want to create experiences that everyone in the class can do. We don't want people to be kind of feeling left behind or anything like that. It's not so much about pushing people or teaching them something really complicated. It's about giving everyone the experience of what it would be like to work in this area. So, you know, we've got bits that are interactive, we've got bits that are a bit of a story, and it's always quite hands on for the learners. In these guides as well, there's points and prompts where you can share your stories and your knowledge and your experience. And that's really key. That's a really big part of these engagements. So, you know, don't overlook your own experience because this might be the first time that learners have had someone that works in this area coming and speaking to them you know they might not know people from the sort of personal life or neighbors that work in tech so this is a really good chance for them to learn just a bit more and and have a sort of friendly face to the to the sector so you know we've got guides on existing resources on our website but a few other ones as well that we've developed with industry partners so just the other week we tested out one that was with data security um, and we produced that with 
SSE, the energy company. So volunteers from SSE were able to take our lesson pack, spend a few hours customising it and learning it, and then they delivered a really successful engagement a few days later with a class. And I think they're actually planning on running another one using the, the resource again. So that saved them a lot of time and it means they can focus on you know, sharing that knowledge and reaching as many people as possible. Brilliant. And you've got another one coming up, Daniel. The yes. Development. Yes, so we've got a software development one coming up in the next month or so. So that one's been produced with BGSS and they are a software consultancy. So they work with a lot of big companies and they produce sort of software or other kind of technical consultancy things. So we're producing a guide and a lesson pack with them in coding and, and programming, but it's all about code quality. You know, how can you program like a professional software developer? What are the kind of things which maybe aren't in the school curriculum or are just slightly touched on that are actually really important skills if you're doing this as a job? So we're focusing on things like how can you produce code that's really readable and understandable by other people? You know, how can you share that code with other people? So yeah, that one's coming up in the next in the next month or so. <laughs> I was gonna say very soon, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, very soon. <laughs> So just to summarise there, what are your get, what can you get from this project? Well, you're getting a best practice guide, which is filled with the information that you need to be able to run a session. And you get a resource catalogue, which points you towards trusted materials that we know are brilliant in the classroom. And we've even made a bunch of those full lesson packs with all the notes, all the slides and all the examples, everything that you would need or a volunteer would need to pick it up and start using it. And a lot of that is also linked into our interactive um, resource website. So this is Cyber Skills Live. So this is where we have all our different interactive resources as well. And I'm just looking at some of them just now. How to rob a bank, one of the most popular ones. Defend the hospital. Um, code a data selfie with JavaScript, which has been really popular as well, and defend the rhino with data science, Daniel. That's 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 been a you know it's it's grown in popularity as well, that one. Yeah, it has. that one's not a security one, that's a that's a data science one. Yeah. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into what the resources are that are available. But what we're going to be doing um today is we're going to be solving a murder. So for the next sort of half an hour or so, you're going to become our digital detectives and help us crack this case. So tell us in the chat, has anyone had any experience of criminal investigations before? Has anyone been involved in a, in a murder case? <laughs> has anyone used digital forensics? It would just be interesting to know. Yeah, exactly. Thank goodness, Lula. No, nope. Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> Just checking. We've because we've done this type of thing before where we get to the end of a workshop and someone's like, oh, that was really good. That was brilliant. And it's like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm Digital Forensics Chief at Police Scotland or whatever. And you're like, oh, you could have told us <laughs> like we could have asked you a few things. Um, maybe we should start with a little video then, Daniel. Yes, yeah, let's start with the, the video again. This is another thing that you get with most activities is a video that kind of sets the scene. So yeah, let's play the video. In modern policing, collecting evidence at a crime scene is more than just dusting for fingerprints or searching for strands of hair. In many crimes, there can be a trail of digital evidence that leads directly to the criminal. In this interactive lesson, you're going to step into the shoes of a digital forensic specialist and use your digital skills to solve a crime. Police were alerted to the discovery of a man's body in Bishop Briggs, Glasgow. An eyewitness gave a statement that he saw another man leaving the office. The description of the man matches that of known fugitive Chris Malam, who police are keen to speak to about a series of murders. We are cordoned off an area for forensic examination as work continues to understand the circumstances around the man's death. A piece of digital evidence was recovered at the crime scene. Your challenge is to use your digital skills to solve the crime and help the police catch the murderer. First, 
you'll identify, log and validate the digital evidence recovered at the crime scene. Then you'll investigate the digital evidence to look for clues. Finally, you'll recover the key evidence to lead police to the suspect. The case is fictional, but this is based on actual techniques and procedures that are used in real cases. Now it's time to start the investigation. Follow the instructions and let's see if you can track the case. All right, Daniel, that sounds like a challenge. I think it does, yes. <laughs> so I think what we can do is let's let's get hands on and, and play the activity um, together. So Craig, do you want to direct where you want me and everyone to go to? Yes. So I'm going to put into the chat a link to, was that, is that an alternative camera angle? That's now? not alternative because I'm going to that screen now. <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Um, So I'm going to get everyone to go to this website just now. Now, what I would suggest is that it may be that you just want to watch Daniel playing along rather than trying along at the same time, but you, you can do it either way. You can either be playing along with us as we do it and we'll go at a relatively slow pace, or you might prefer just to watch Daniel playing it. It's being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it back and try it yourself later. I can also tell you, Daniel, that we're, we're not alone playing it this morning. I can see that Inverness High School have been playing it in the past five or ten minutes. So um, if we bump into anyone while we're solving this case, Daniel, they might be from Inverness High School. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Daniel, you're on the Cyber Skills Live website here. Yep. So I'm on the website. Um, so I've clicked your link, Craig, and it's taken me to the kind of like how to solve a murder page. So for each activity, we've got a bit of an overview. And then we've got some objectives and then there's that video that, that we just watched together. But let's start the lesson. Okay. You know, so I'm just going to back to the start. All right. I was testing this out five minutes earlier and I've already <laughs> got halfway through it. There you go. Right. Super. So. Say my name and then I'm just going to say what school I'm at. So you can put in any school that you want at the moment, or you can choose other and put the name of another group down as well. That's just the way that we help keep track of what who's playing it and, and how often they play it. That's how I know that Inverness have been playing it recently. So the first step, Daniel, choose your avatar. Choose your avatar. Oh, which one should I go for? Which one looks like me? It doesn't need to look like you. It looks like me. Which one? Do? Let's go for this one. Who would you like to be? Nice hat. Nice hat. It's not letting me click it. It's probably because I reset my cookies and then didn't refresh the page. I can't believe you've crashed it already. Right, yeah, I broke a website. The first 10 seconds. <laughs> Cut corners. OK. Got my avatar. There we go. Let's get started. OK, so if there's any questions while we're playing this, you can type it into the chat or ask us. But the first thing we've got here is you heard in the video there, David says that there's a, a piece of digital evidence that's been recovered at this murder crime scene. So what we need to do is log that evidence, Daniel. Yeah, so the, the first step of our investigation is to log the evidence that we've got into our computer system. And it's really important that we create these records so that we can prove that the evidence collected at the crime scene is the same evidence being presented at a court of law. So we've got a picture here of the device collected and it says it's an external hard drive and there it is in its evidence bag. We've got a wee magnifying glass as well. So Craig, what we've got to do is log this into the forensic report system. So Craig, I think it said it was a, a hard drive, right? That's right. It's a hard okay. drive. So I guess before we actually get hands on, we have to kind of do the administration, so let's lock this into the system. The first thing to note there, Daniel, was like, it, there was a massive list there of all the different devices that could have pos possibly been. And um, I can see that some of you had chosen, you know, was it a USB flash drive? Was it a, you know, a smart speaker or something like that? And it shows you now that in every sort of criminal investigation, there's going to be a lot of devices that need to be analysed and looked at, whether it's smartphones or tablets or watches. So 
I can understand why we need more people who have these digital skills that can process this information. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's so many different devices there, and they're all slightly different to investigate. So, you know, there is so many more different pieces of evidence you have to look at these days when there's when there's crimes. So, yeah, there's lots of different job opportunities in this area. So let's continue on, and it's saying here who's the manufacturer. So we need to look at the image again, and we need to log the name of the company that made this device. So Craig, can you see it on the hard drive? What's the manufacturer? It is just about, it's up a little bit, it's underneath the My yes. Passport, yeah, Western Digital. Western Digital. Okay, let's submit that. And I can see that um, Mrs. Azen from Uddingston Grammar got that correct as well. Well done. Super. So we now need a serial number as well. So Craig, we need the the serial number so that we we can basically identify that particular hard drive in the in the evidence bag. So that's a unique identifier. So you know, no other hard drive in the world is going to have the same serial number as the one that's printed on here. So this will make sure we don't get our our evidence jumbled up between cases. So let's see. So let's use the magnifying glass. Yeah, Oops, serial number e four seven t t two t t two. And before you type that in, Daniel Catherine's asking, what happens if you get it wrong? So why don't you deliberately get it wrong? Okay, so that's e four seven t t t. So that's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. So I've got to check your answer and try again. Yeah. So to answer that question, yeah, if you get it wrong. For most questions, it will tell you that you've got it wrong and you've got the chance to do it again. There are a couple of open questions where it doesn't matter what you've said, it will still let you continue. Yeah, and the kind of message that you get if you get it wrong changes depending on the, the question as well. So, this is one that people get wrong quite a lot. This is one that people sometimes get wrong. So we need to log the date and the time that this device, this hard drive, was seized by the police. So it says here it was seized on Monday the 26th of October 2020 at 8pm. It's quite a long running case, Craig. Um, we need to add the date into the evidence system. So what's the day? The day is the 26th. Mm -hmm. And the month was October 2020. Mm -hmm. And it was 8pm. So 20 yeah. That's the part that learners tend to get wrong. They choose eight yes. rather than 20 hundred hours. And we can see that when they type it in. But I can see that um, <laughs> not many people made that mistake in ours. Maha got it spot on right away. Good job. <laughs> so where was the device seized? So Craig, we got like a, a snippet of a map. Mm -hmm. Bishop Briggs. Um, so it was seized at 14 Birch Grove Street. Okay, Doc. That's great. So before we go into this next part, remember one of the things that you said, Daniel, was that the questions are written in a way that is about making sure that everyone in the class can follow along and, and sort of play along with the story as well. So. Everything that we've covered so far has mainly been about reading the information, following the instructions and typing it in. It doesn't ask them to do a lot, but it still gives them that experience of what it would be like logging something into the criminal evidence system. And that's, you know, e even though it might seem quite straightforward, it, that's by design. We've deliberately done it that way. I wish I wish all computer systems, Daniel, were as easy to follow along as that. As well, before we jump on, let's um, show you what the the lesson guide looks like up to this point. So um, how to solve a murder. So this this is the link I put in the chat, but will be shared with you again at the end of the session. This is where you can find all the lesson guides. So this is a lesson guide for how to solve a murder. And if we scroll down a bit, so we've got things like the topic, who it's for, who, what volunteers it would suit, the skill level for this one, saying, saying this is suitable for beginners. You don't need to have any kind of prior knowledge in cybersecurity or digital forensics and here's the kind of like lesson plan table itself so if we go down to starting the activity 
here's basically the instructions that we were giving you like go to cyberskillslesson.com and choose how to solve a murder it will work in any modern web browser like google chrome or firefox you'll be asked what school you're joining from well, that's what we that's what we did at the start choose your name and an avatar and then here we go like that first few set of questions all about logging the evidence so these are the things that we collected and you know there's some sort of topics that you know the volunteer could chat about so you know is it you want to talk about the chain of custody of the forensic link or the paper trail and that's basically like that kind of process of documenting the collection transfer and analysis of the the evidence and you know we have to do all that logging we have to type all these things in because you know any contamination or tampering could lead to the evidence being challenged or ruled inadmissible in a court of law. Yeah, the idea being that like by logging the evidence really carefully and keeping a track of it, we can be sh confident that when that hard drive or when that USB drive is presented as evidence in court, that we've got a record that nobody has changed it, nobody's interfered with it, it's been logged correctly at every step of the process. And, you know, we need more people who have those skills to do those things. So we've logged the evidence into our system, Daniel, but now we actually want to start preparing to analyse it. So like, we want to do some analysis on it. We want to find out what's on that hard drive. What do we need to do to allow us to do that? Well, we're going to be using a command line tool to do this. So on the left hand side, there'll be the instructions. And on the right hand side is where we basically type commands into the computer system. So our, ro our Robopolis um, computer system here. So rather than using dragging and dropping or clicking on things, we're just going to type stuff in. But actually the best way to do this is by copying and pasting. So this one here, Daniel, it says take a digital copy. It's important that we never perform analysis on the original USB drive because we might accidentally destroy or tamper with the evidence. So the first thing that we need to do is create an exact clone of the drive and a forensic clone is an exact bit for bit copy of the USB drive. So we're going to do in this using a tool called DD. We're going to use the DD command. This will create an exact copy of the USB drive and save it to our computer. So Daniel, why don't you copy that command from our instructions and okay. paste it into the drive? So I'm going to copy and paste this because I don't trust myself to type it in accurately. And then we'll press enter to run it. So here's a command DD. And start. OK, so let's do that. Oh, Craig, that's working. So it says it's preparing to clone. Mm -hmm. There we go, it's starting the clone. So there in real life, Daniel, this cloning process would take quite a while. Like if you were trying to clone a 500 gigabyte hard drive, it might take a couple hours at least. Yeah, um, and I think it's something that's worth us noting is when we're using the, the term and when we're sort of typing these commands in, this is kind of representative of the actual commands that you would run to do this process. So, you know, if you did have a hard drive plugged into your computer and it had that name, if you run that command, it would actually make a copy of it onto your computer. It would actually clone the hard drive. So although this is simulated, it is very much based on the, the real commands and the real process that you would use, you know, this next command here. That's another real command that you could actually you know, run on your own computer, but we're simulating it in a web browser because we know that lots of schools don't have access to this or it might be blocked or they prefer that people's weren't actually, you know, typing in commands on the school's computers. So that this basically gives classes an opportunity to do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. That command that you just ran there, Daniel, DD, meaning mm -hmm. to clone the hard drive. I didn't know what DD stood for. Do you know what it stands for? Do you know, I uh, I only learned this the other day as well, funnily enough. <laughs> and it's not, I thought it was maybe something with like duplication, uh -huh. um, but it's but it's not. It, Craig, do you want to, I'll, I'll let you go. DD, of course, stands for carbon copy. Or, you know, so DD actually stands for CC. But the difference is that there was already another tool called CC, so they couldn't call it that, so they just called it DD. So I'd looked that up because someone had asked me, because I thought it was like disk duplication, Daniel, or something like that. But it turns out, no, they've just called it DD because they couldn't call it CC. Anyway, 
let's um, go to our next step, Daniel. So we've cloned the hard drive, so we've got a copy of it. So we've made that forensic clone, but we need to check that it's an exact copy, that nothing's gone wrong when we've cloned it. So to do this, we can use the MD5 sum tool. So what that does is it calculates a hash, which is a number, that we can treat like a digital fingerprint for the file. Only that file or an exact copy of it will have the same hash number, will have that same digital fingerprint. So we know that if we run this command, if we run the MD5 sum command and the numbers are the same for the original and the copy, those fingerprints match, then we can be confident that it's a perfect clone. So that's what we need to try, Daniel. We need to try and calculate the hash values here. OK, so let's copy that command and we'll paste it in. So yeah, we need to be really certain that this copy we're making is identical. Otherwise, you know, that's not the same as the evidence, like we're investigating something different. So, OK, so we're calculating the hash. And again, Craig, this has taken a wee bit of time to to process. But again, that's realistic. You know, if you are creating hash, it's basically like looking through every single bit on that hard drive to create that number. And even if you change like one letter, you move one full stop in one document somewhere in that hard drive, it would result in a completely different hash number. And that's why we're doing this. We need to make sure that these that this copy is identical to the original evidence. So we're almost there, four fifths. That's great. I can see um, Maha's got calculated the hash as well. That's good. Ours is nearly done. If, if you were doing this in real life with a group like, and you were actually using the tools, that would take literally 24 hours, maybe more than that for a 500 gigabyte file. It just takes a long time. So that's why we've simulated it here. Oh, what's it saying, Daniel? So brilliant. The digital fingerprints match. The copy worked. The next step is to mount the copy of the image. So basically mounting is the way that we can take that copy and it will act as if it's just like the USB drive that we've plugged into our computer. It treats it like that. So we need to mount the file in read only mode. Remember, Daniel, we don't want to be changing anything we just want to read only so this means we don't accidentally change any of the information on the drive so we've got one more command here to copy daniel yep so let's copy that command so this is going to let us take that copy we've made and we're going to be able to browse through it as if it was actually plugged into the computer even though the real hard drive is actually going to be in an evidence bag kept somewhere kept somewhere nice and safe and we're doing it read only because you know, we don't want to be able to change it. That might be tampering with the evidence. So, OK, we're mounting it. Checking the image. There we go. Mounted successfully. The drive is now ready to be analysed. Super. Craig, I think we can start analysing that digital evidence now, finally. So, so that, that second section there, again, Basically, you know, a little bit more complicated than the first part, but ultimately they're needing to copy and paste the commands in. So even if they're not fully understanding what is a hash, what is a forensic clone, if they can copy and paste in the commands, they can still continue with the activity. This is the part where they're now using a bit more investigative skills. So this is the part that's important that they follow the instructions in the correct order. If most people get this part wrong, it's usually because they've 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 typed the command in the wrong order basically so Daniel we've mounted the drive we're going to go and look into it let's start looking for this digital evidence so it's seen here that the suggestion is that we start by reading the text message conversations that have been stored in the computer so like you know one of the most important ways that you could find out what someone has been doing or who they've been talking to would be able to read their their conversations that they've had their instant messages so Daniel, we're going to use a command to go through this drive. So you're going to use the ls command. OK, and the ls command, that's short for list. So it's a wee bit closer to the, the real word than dd was. And that will give you a list of all the things that are in that current directory, which is another name for a folder. So let's run that now. So I've put in ls and Craig, I can see we've got four folders here. We've got a folder called apps a folder called chats, a folder called document and a folder called photos. Yeah. Now, so, on a normal computer, you could move into one of them by just double clicking on it, but we're in the terminal. We can't point and click 
we have to use another command. And that command that we're using is the cd command, followed by the name of that directory of that folder. So this stands for change directory. So Craig, I think we should maybe take a look at the, the chats directory if you want to. Let's, let's move into that folder. So cd chats, you can copy paste it or type it, that's fine. Okay. So now let's list the files that are in that folder again. So the ls command. Okay, ls. So what we're seeing here, Daniel, is these are all the chat logs. These are the files. This is who um, our suspect has been talking to. So Alice, Charlie, Duncan, Elizabeth, Frank, Gemma, Neville and Rafi. Now, Daniel, the instructions here say I recognise one of those names. Neville Doublecross is a known criminal, Daniel. So I am interested to know that what the suspect has been chatting to Neville Doublecross about. So let's read the chat log. So to see the contents of a file, we're going to use the cat command. So C-A-T. Neville, yeah, copy and paste it, Daniel. Don't trust your typing. Well, I've, I've only got one hand for this. Uh, that's a, a, a dog on my arm. <laughs> Um, OK, so Craig, what happened yes. there was I, I hit that, I typed in that cat command and now that's printed out literally hundreds of messages between Chris and Neville. You know, these are just even over like a few days. Like they're having loads of messages, Craig. A yes, so the, the problem is that you might have, you know, a big chat conversation with someone. We don't have much time. We need to narrow it down. So we can use another digital tool to help us. So it says here, this is a massive chat conversation. We don't have enough time to read through it all, but we can use a tool called grep to mm -hmm. search the file. So let's try searching for the phrase Bishop Briggs, Daniel, because that's where we know that this happened. So what this will do is search through that file and pick out any of the times that the word Bishop Briggs has been mentioned. So Daniel, I can see the chat here. Chris says, the traffic is murder in Bishop Briggs. It's not that type of murder we're looking for today. Uh, Neville says the sooner the bypass opens, the better. And then Chris says, you need to come visit me in Bishop Briggs sometime. OK, interesting. But I don't think this is, you know, this isn't good enough evidence here, Daniel. Like we've not narrowed it down. No, this isn't helping us with our case. So I think we need to try searching for some other potentially suspicious words. So we could search for getaway or weapon, criminal, hideout, safe house. I think maybe, I don't know which one, I'm thinking I might search for hideout next. Okay, yeah, go for it. Try. Why don't we try one more first? Let's try um, like weapon. Weapon. It's like they might have talked about, okay, no matches. Okay, so there was no chats that mentioned weapon. Okay, fair enough. Try a different one. Oh, okay. So there's a message on the 28th of November, Craig, and it's from Chris. And Chris said, I've planned my escape. I've just booked my ticket to the secret hideout. And then Neville replies, what, barely five minutes later, good, I'll meet you there. Make sure you're not followed. Interesting. So I planned my escape. I just booked my ticket to the secret hideout. And then Neville says, good, I'll meet you there. Make sure you're not followed. This is key evidence here. I think, Daniel, someone, you know, that the suspect here is hoping to travel to a secret location. I wonder where he'll go and can we catch him in time? So let's see if we can find some more digital evidence that could lead us to where the suspect might be. Yeah, let's continue. So, OK. So if you were planning a secret getaway, by that I mean you're a criminal planning a secret getaway, how, and you, you'd probably have to use a computer nowadays, Daniel, to sort of like plan it in some way, wouldn't you? You would maybe look it up on a map or you would book tickets to it or you would do some research like, you know, where, where could I hide out? Where could I stay in these places? So people's web browsing history would actually tell you a lot about that. Yeah, like if we know that, on the 28th of November, Chris planned his escape. I can't imagine he probably went and got his OS map out and his AA route planner and did all that. He's probably done it online. So there's probably going to be some clues around that day or maybe even just before it, you know, about 
this escape planning. So yeah, I think Craig looking at the web browsing is a really useful place to look, especially now that you know we can cut it down a bit to a slightly smaller on the date range. So let's see if we can find out some information about where it is that they're intending to travel. So it's in here, we're currently in the chat folder, you know, where we've changed into there. I can see it says chats here. So we need to go back a level. And to go back a level, we're going to use this command here, which is CD and then a two sort of full stops. So let's run that command. Okay, we're not in chats anymore. Okay, let's and move into the apps folder, yeah. Daniel. So CD apps. Okay, CD apps. Okay. And let's, let's have a look and see where we are. Okay. So we're in the apps folder now. So these are all the apps that are installed on this computer. Um, it's the web browser we're interested in, Daniel. So let's CD into the web browser folder. Yep. So CD and then web hyphen. Web browser. OK, I can see we're in apps web browser. Super. Let's have a look at those files. So let's type in LS So list all the files. Craig, there's one file here. It's called website history log. Yeah, that's the one we want. So why don't we display the contents of that? So cat. Cat website history log. OK, so we're going to look at the file and the file I want to look at is website history log. Yep. That makes sense. Brilliant. So this is the web history. This is the browsing history of the suspect. So we can see every single web page they've went on for the past a few weeks at least since yes. they last looked at their browsing history. So we can tell Daniel that they've been on BBC Weather, they've looked on the Megabus website, they've been on, <laughs> they've been on Skills Development Scotland's website. Um, but the, these are these are the types of logs that you might find on someone's computer. Yeah, we can see, you know, like the dates, the times, and then the web page they visit. This is all kind of like typical stuff you'd find on a computer. So this is basically a massive list of all the URLs or the website addresses that the suspect has visited. So, you know, it's saying here, scroll this to many there are, Craig, there's literally hundreds and they go over a period of a few months. At We're least. never going to be able to read all them. We need to narrow it down. We need to search them, Daniel. So it's in here we can use the grep command again to find only the web pages or the URLs that were accessed on the day that that text message was sent. And that grep command is the one that we used when we were searching through the text to find things like Bishop Briggs or hideout, which was the kind of keyword. So yeah, let's use that command. So that's going to look up messages sent on the 26th of October. And I think that's the date that the murder might have taken place. So Greg, there's a few things that were viewed on that day. So I can see here. Um, yeah, so if these were the web pages that he visited on that day. You tell us in the chat, which one of them do you think might be worth us investigating further? What one do you think might have evidence that would give away what he's been planning on that day? Tell us in the chat. And Craig and Maha straight in there with the Scotia Rail website. Not Scott Rail, Craig, we don't want sued. It's Scotia Rail. That's right. Yeah, definitely something there, Daniel. Do you see that? The third one down. Yep. Booking confirmation. Booking confirmation. <clears throat> you mean you don't think they're planning the getaway using the, the policies page on the Skills Development Scotland website? <laughs> no, maybe not. Right. So Everyone's saying this Scotia Rail one. So do you know what, Craig? I think we should just go take a look at that web page. Let's see. So I'm just going to copy that. What are the instructions saying while I do so that? Saying, basically, you want to copy that URL, that website, open it in a new tab in your browser, and we're trying to work out where the suspect is heading. Okay. So let's copy and paste that into a new tab and head to that page. Here we go. Scotia Rail, your booking confirmation. A single ticket and a single ticket, not a return. Suspicious. 10 10 a.m. from GLQ. Mm -hmm. And then four hours later, it arrives at DNO. DNO. Mama mm. looks as if she's looked that up. What, oh, yeah. what is the station code for DNO? Do we know? 
Yeah, Did well, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've memorized all your stations, you'll know what that is instantly. But if you've not, this is a hyperlink actually. So do you know? That's so you could either Google it or you could just click on the link and let's see. What... So okay, so that is a train station and it's Dunrobin Castle. So that's, that's exactly that's what Maha said. Maha that's... said Dunrobin Castle is okay. the station. So let's go back to the. Oops, I almost left the team's color. Um, digital forensics report. OK. Can you tell where the suspect is heading? Type of place name. Well, I Dun think Robin Castle. Dun Robin Castle. It's a request stop, Daniel, as well. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think you solved it. I think you solved it. I must have accidentally skipped I think you, it. I think you double clicked it and you moved on. But if you if you fill out the evaluation very quickly, Daniel, you'll see the final result. I'm filling out the feedback like a high school student. Yeah, I hope you don't do that in our forms normally. Well, we've seen you show she loved it. Yeah, of course. Here we are. There we Brilliant. go. This is the page I somehow skipped. <laughs> so well done, Daniel. You've solved it. You've managed to work out um, that Dunrobin Castle was the place where the suspect is heading. And there you've got your Alba Police Digital Evidence Report, Daniel. Yeah, so PC Daniel of Brigadoon High School Division interrogated a USB hard drive and, you know, performed a full digital forensic analysis, discovered communications between suspect and known criminal and discovered browsing history suggesting suspect is intending to travel by train to a location in the Highlands. So this is the type of thing now, at, you know, at the end of the activity, there's a few ways that you could have played this with the class. You could do what me and Daniel were doing there, where you lead them through it, you kind of tell the story with it, but all the instructions are also built into the activity. So another way that you could do it is you could introduce it, set the scene, put people on the website and get them to work through it while you sort of support them. If, if you were doing it in person in the future, that would be the probably the best way to do it. But doing it virtually, you might do it like the way Daniel and I did it there. And what that should hopefully you could hopefully you can see that one of the benefits of doing that way now is that at this point the learners will have a better understanding of like what is digital forensics why is it important what are the types of things that you might do if you work in a digital forensics team and that doesn't matter whether you're in the police or whether you're in another organization a lot of these you know steps will be the same and at that point, they're probably in a better position to ask you questions about what you do in your job or, you know, a bit more about what it's actually like as well. So at the end of it, there'll be links to those resources. And I think, Daniel, on the um, end of the lesson plan, there's like the frequently asked questions that people normally ask to. There is, yes. So. In the lesson plan again, we've got instructions for the other bits that we did. So sort of looking through the messages, we've highlighted the key messages in case you've you know, not got it up on your screen at the same time. Finding the hideout, asking us to look at each of the page once for Scotia Rail. We should look at this one, look at the destination. And there's the answer. So but yes, Craig, you were mentioning those kind of frequently asked questions. So you probably definitely want to have some sort of Q&A time with the class at the end, especially after, like you say, Craig, kind of warmed up to the idea of what digital forensics is, the types of tools they use, the types of cases that they might be solving. So, you know, but there are questions that, you know, you can't expect everyone to know like the model answers to. to. So we've provided some answers of kind of the types of things that ask. how much do you get paid? Well, you might not want to see your own salary. That's probably not useful to them, but you could say people work in digital forensics on average get paid around 25,000 when they start and with experience, you can earn 30 to 45 or 18 more senior roles. Do you only work with the police? I know a lot of digital forensics people work with businesses that have accidentally deleted files or think they've suffered from cybercrime. Maybe someone only sometimes works with the police. Where can you study? What school subjects should you pick? So we've given some answers to those questions, which, you know, from experience, these are the questions that get asked, get asked the most often.
And I think what's important about those answers, Daniel, is that they're relevant to learners in Scotland and they're quite specific answers. So like, where can I study digital forensics? Actually saying the name of the course, the fact that you could do it as an apprenticeship, the fact that Aberté University offer it as well, or there's, you know, different specific options. And um, same with like what subjects should you choose as well, being able to sort of give more concrete answers to those is useful too. But hopefully, I think that's us got to the end, Daniel, of the, the lesson pack and the lesson plan. And that's us covered the sort of activity and what you could expect to find in one of these sources as well. So we've got a little bit of time now as well. If you've got any questions about the activity, if you've got any questions about the other materials that we've made, the other things on the website, then Daniel and I would be happy to talk to you about it just now. Um, when we have the exercises, is someone from your team with us or uh, are we the only ones kind of leading the lesson? Yeah, so I think Debbie, am I right in saying that the, the idea is that you would team up with the, um, the school yourself? SDS might be able to help facilitate some of those initial conversations, but it would be the, the industry volunteer, like someone from your team working with them. Uh, is that right, Debbie? What I've got, and I'll share with everyone on the call um, afterwards, is an entire toolkit to just sort of support and help with industry, um, sorry, school engagement. Um, if you're feeling confident to just, you know, go forward and put some opportunity out there, which is through the marketplace platform, um, then that that's a sort of straightforward route to do it. And a school will then sign up for um, that offer. Um, if you're looking for a bit more support, um, a bit more. Um, support around what to deliver and how to deliver it and then actually reaching out to schools. It's something that me, well, SDS, but pretty much me would work with um, folks on to help. So, as I said, I'll follow up afterwards and I'll share links, but if you're wanting to contact me or have a chat with me directly, that's fine as well. Perfect, thank you. Lula, what's the name of the company that you're part of? Version 1. Yeah, version 1, just wondering, that's great. That's cool. Does anyone else uh, have any? I, I was going to say, if, if Ula's going to look at one of the other resources, Daniel, I would say that the best one for IT company might be one like the debugging coding disasters on the website or the ones that are being published that you worked on with um, BGSS, the testing. Yeah. I'll show you the debugging um, one just quickly just so you, you get an idea because the um, yeah I quickly went through the lessons I like the defending rhino one but I, I like data science um so so maybe I, I'm biased um what what I would kind of ideally like I think it would be for you Debbie if uh, I could follow up with an email or maybe we could schedule a quick call just because the cases they don't really tell you exactly what sort of concepts are delivered um, you kind of like they just give you very over uh, um, high level overview of what's done so just to make sure that we actually have people who do exactly this so um, I should reach out to you Debbie I'm assuming yeah, yeah, please okay, do. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. follow up after the call and it would be great to have a, a chat with you, yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah, we can help with that, Debbie, if you need any details about those concepts. We haven't put them all on the home, like the, the front of it, because that's where the pupils would normally go in and they probably don't need to see that, but, but the actual people who are leading it would want to know that. That's great. Uh, Belinda, I can see that Maha had your hand up and Belinda's got a question in the chat. So I'll go for Belinda first and then I'll come to you, Maha. So Belinda says, are all the courses designed for secondary age and any plans for primary? Do you find them useful for young people with autism, for example? So the courses that all these activities were originally designed for sort of S1 to S4. However, we've written them in a way that we know that they can work for older age groups, but also for, I would say, upper primary tend to be using it too. And I think Daniel and Debbie, our statistics seem to suggest that primary schools are using it and playing it, even though it's probably not, some of the wording isn't ideal for that age range. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that the vast majority of the plays are from high school students because that's who we kind of promoted to but we do get primary schools playing as well uh, mostly it's primary sixes and, and primary sevens and 
they are kind of definitely capable of doing all of the activities. You know, we don't ask them to do anything that's too technically difficult, but I suspect that without maybe some of the kind of extra knowledge of things you might have picked up by that kind of age or even the things that you start doing in like S1 computing and stuff, that probably means that the high school students probably get more out of it, I would say, because they probably understand a bit more like it won't be quite so new to them. Um, they might be kind of like understanding why they're doing rather than just blindly following the instructions. But that's not to say that the activities aren't probably fun or a bit different for, for yeah. primary kids. But yeah. Um, yeah, I would say if you're going to do it with a primary school, get the primary teacher to sort of play it first and they'll know best. Like they'll know like, oh, that would work for my class or, oh, for example, that one that we were doing today, obviously the accuracy of typing was important. So it would need to be a primary school class who, who knew how to cut and paste or knew how to type accurately. So little things like that would make it a, like a good experience. Like Daniel's doing one in a couple of weeks and we spoke to the teacher to make sure that you know to find out oh, how much programming knowledge have they got so far what level are they at so that we knew that we we had the right resource for them and regarding uh, young people with autism as well it's not something that we've measured as part of this course you know so it's not i i don't have any evidence for that but we know that certain groups who work with children with autism have used it as a resource and emailed us about it but we don't have any i can't give you any evidence that says yeah it worked brilliantly or no that it didn't work yeah we just kind of got to go kind of like we've, we've been told we see that there's certain like schools or like uh, asn units within schools sometimes use it and they've said that you know it sometimes suits some of their their pupils, but we don't have anything sort of concrete. Um, I would say that kind of when we design it, we do try and keep it as accessible as yeah. we can, but we probably, we haven't actually designed it with that in mind, but hopefully it doesn't extend. But yeah, we have a, we are- One, one thing that we have had to do for Autism Daniel was, do you remember how we pointed out quite subtly in this one, but in How to Rob a Bank, the fact that it's not actually a murder, no one, has been killed you're not actually robbing a bank in the bank one because you know we, we were told that sometimes people take these activities quite literally and if we're playing along with the fact that oh this is a murder you're investigating a crime you know some some young people for various reasons might take that to heart and, and might think this has actually happened but as long as you you know if you let people know at the start like this is you know fictional we're making this up but we're going to play along then that tended to that that helped us with that. I think someone I can't remember who Daniel, but someone told us to make sure we did that. Thanks, Belinda. Uh, Maha, did you have a question as well? Thank you. Um, so one, I think partially Belinda asked that. So is um, because though I'm trying to deliver this to a mixed sort of group. So there are quite a few primary ones, but there are quite a few secondary pupils who are maybe want to do more of Python. And I'm like, I can't do like like too much of the coding and stuff. But yeah, this could be a starting point. So how do you suggest I get on to deliver something to a mixed sort of like, I, I think it's like P3s to S2s or something that yeah. sort of mixed group. And also if, uh, we might be ha we might have a crunch of the like the number of devices and yeah. um, so I'm guessing it's it should work on phones or mobile phones as like phones as well so hopefully that might be something we can request like parents to get mm -hmm. uh, but yeah if if it's if we are having like more than one person in a in, on a device how do you kind yeah. of suggest to do that so my suggestion would be if, if if I was asked to do this to a mixed group, sort of like younger learners, older learners, and I had a limited number of devices, mm -hmm. what I'd be doing is I would take the older learners and I would let them play the activity first. So that say it was this how to solve a murder, mm -hmm. I would get them to do the activity and work through it. But what then I would do is I would say to them, OK, you're going to be teaming up with you know a buddy from P4 and you're going to coach them through doing the activity. So I want you to learn it so that you know how it works, so that you can then explain it to, you know, your, your primary four learner as well. So that's like a peer programming exercise almost where you've got two people on the one computer and then your primary seven person is the sort of navigator. So they're helping the, the, the younger one sort of complete it. 
and then it's the younger one who has got the hands on, who is doing the, the thing there. So you've got quite a few really nice things there where you've got that peer assisted learning, mm -hmm. you've got that sharing the knowledge and you've got the ability for them to sort of, we all know, we've all done a little bit of teaching or presenting before you know that you learn better when you've actually shown someone how else how to do it too. So that would be my suggestion about um, that that approach there. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I was thinking in the same line, so thank you so much it's for coming. You're that. definitely thinking, uh, that's that's the only way that you could do it without it. Otherwise, what you would end up doing is the people who are really good at it and older, yeah. they'd either be fed up like that, oh, this is taking ages yeah. because this lot down here are taking a long time, or yeah. you would hopelessly have left behind <laughs> the primary fours and fives, which you don't want either. Yeah. Um, in terms of the activity, like our activities are designed mainly, these ones anyway, for the desktop computers or laptops where because there's a bit of typing involved. Mm -hmm. They probably would work on tablets and phones, but I would say Daniel not not well. Like would would you agree with that? Like it's hard it's not as easy. I would say it depends on the activity, but most of them require you to type some things in. And if you're on a phone, then the keyboard's gonna cover up half of the screen or even just from experience copying and pasting on a phone can get quite fiddly so i'm just imagining that someone like in this activity we just did there some of the steps we had to copy in those cd and those ls commands and i can see it becoming almost a bit of a kind of you'd spend just as long trying to type a copy and paste and that might distract you a bit from the activity or the story so some activities work better than others so like for example on like a, a tablet things like defend the rhino works works quite well Okay. Uh, but some of the other ones maybe like coding disasters where you actually got to edit some python code and then run it and it helps you through that i maybe wouldn't do that one on a tablet because the keyboard might be covering up part of the screen and it might be a bit more frustrating okay that makes sense um and sorry i don't know if i if you mentioned that but it's just um, i'm i'm intrigued um who did you develop this like activity did you like speak to some people the murder yeah the murder one we we had spoken to people from police scotland but they didn't like they didn't co-write it with us but we asked them that is this the type of thing that happens is this mm -hmm. what goes on and then adharma who are a digital forensic specialist company or i think they do all sorts of cyber security but mo who we worked with he played this activity and he works in digital forensics and I think his response, Daniel, was, I wish I'd had that when I was at school. Um, although it isn't what he does on a day to day, he doesn't do it for the police. He does it for other um, reasons. But um, yeah, so we, we've kind of checked it with, but it's, it's not being co-written with one particular company. Mm, OK, cool. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. Does anyone have any more questions? Catherine, I can see you're typing. No, it's just not a question that I'm going to have to go, but I was just going to say it was really, really good. I really enjoyed going through the resource and it, it helped to actually do it with yourselves rather than just that, read. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, reading the lesson plan would be useful, but, like, I think actually seeing us do it, try it out, watching the videos probably for a lot of people would, would make more sense. And now that when you go back to look at the, the lesson plan at some point, hopefully it'll all jump out and you'll be like, oh, that's what they were doing there or that's what that meant. Yeah, I feel like um, I go into the other resources now myself and have a good yeah. look around. Uh, Catherine, they also sent us like an actual video of Daniel going through it. Um, I, I can't find the link, but I'm sure if you ask them, they can send it to you. So besides the actual text, they also like provide us with the video. Great. Thank you for that. Um, quick question about scheduling. So let's say we decide that we want to do the Defend Rhino, let's say. How does the process look like then then you reach out to the schools and then we set a date okay that's right and in, in the in the lesson guide sort of the virtual engagement plan there's a sort of summary of the steps that you would follow in the right order and um, basically you would contact the school first you would speak to them about what classes they're interested you know what, what age are the classes what time would suit the teacher and the class matching that up with the volunteer and then, yeah, getting it into the diary. We, we think that that process would normally take, you'd probably need to spend about an hour or so with the, you know, um, maybe not a full hour, but like half an hour talking to the teacher about those sort of things. 
and then an hour or two at least given the, the chance for the volunteers to practice, to sort of, um, you know, rehearse it before they actually do it with the school. Debbie, I can't remember the suggested total amount of time it would take for um, a volunteer to do it. Do we estimate about half a day in total? Is it something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that half a day is probably more than enough, but it depends on, I suppose, confidence levels as well. If you feel that you can just jump right into it, but I think, you know, it's, it's pretty it's a pretty good idea to sort of practice it a wee bit on your own before going into the school and just having that um, confidence and running through it. So, and then the actual session would take a period. So that'd be what an hour. Yeah. That's great. I can see Belinda typing. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Well, oh. uh, yeah, I'm going right. to drop off now. I have a call soon. Um, Debbie, I'll reach out to like I speak to some people in the company and they reach out to you. Awesome. Brilliant. I look forward to speaking to you soon. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for the everyone. brilliant initiative. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. I'm waiting for my certificate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put our heads together, Maha, and see how we can get something sorted for you. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> You're, you might be getting a badge soon as well, though, Maha, from your other course. Oh, no, because of course you missed one of them. You'll just need to I'm catch so up with that. I'm so angry. I'm so angry that I can't. It's our board meeting, Mel, so. That's understandable. I hope we get funding to run that course again and then you can get the badge. So, yeah. yeah. I was going to see if I can, like, record, like, a, I have a screen recorder, maybe record it go through it later and say by the way i have finished the course but i, I need to be there like craig is still in the chat i guess so <laughs> i need to be in the board meeting i can't be doing both at yes. the same time that's fine that's fine we'll keep you up to date when we're doing it again so that you yeah, definitely get an is, invite. Is it just for like this financially you had the funding yeah we we had we we were felt we did it twice we did the full course twice and then it was fully booked and they gave us one more set and they were like it has to be done by the end of march so we did that and then we're hoping that th there's been a huge number of people signing up. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I did send the feed in the feedback like you should have more sessions booked. Like we'll use that as evidence. Thanks very yes. much, Maha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Daniel. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.